Welcome to the United Nations Climate Ambition Summit 2021. I will be introducing you to our speakers today who will guide you through mitigation to climate change. First, we have Molly McGovern to provide an update on climate statistics. What is climate change? The atmosphere is made up of gases and some naturally trap heat from the sun. Without this greenhouse effect, life couldn't exist because the earth would freeze. These gases follow natural cycles of being released into the atmosphere and absorbed into the earth. Think about photosynthesis. Plants absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen, and animals do the opposite. About 200 years ago, with the Industrial Revolution, humans started changing these cycles dramatically. We began taking lots of extra carbon from deep underground in the form of fossil fuels like coal and gas and releasing it into the atmosphere by burning it for energy. All these extra greenhouse gases are trapping much more heat from the sun inside the atmosphere, and it is causing the average global temperatures to rise dramatically. The last few years have been the hottest ever on record, and scientists predict that every year is getting hotter. That's a big deal because plant and animal life, including human, human civilization, have all developed during a time when the climate has been very stable. Temperature is not the only factor that affects the climate, but scientists agree that rising global temperatures will affect the weather, ecosystems, sea levels, farming, and more. Our challenge is to replace fossil fuels with clean energy like wind turbines and solar panels, which don't release any greenhouse gases or other pollution. We also need to protect natural habitats so forests can pull carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere. Climate change is a global emergency. It impacts virtually every part of our everyday lives, from our health to the food we eat to the water we drink. In some areas, it has become impossible to farm, thereby creating food short shortages. Tree species that were once plentiful in the United States are disappearing and now can mostly be found in our north and in Canada. In other areas, sea levels have risen so substantially that coastal cities experience regular flooding, costing states billions of dollars. Up next is Garrett Howell to discuss the delineation of responsibility in the fight against climate change. When discussing climate change mitigation, a good first step would be to decide who is responsible for putting humanity into this crisis and who should be in charge of our response. When looking at this, we can largely break up responsibility into two categories, individual responsibility and collective responsibility. Collective responsibility can refer to governments as well as other organizations like for-profit companies. Global emissions can be broken down into the categories shown here, with electricity and heat production taking up 25%, agriculture and other land use taking up 24%, industry uh, taking up 21%, transportation taking up 14%, and 16% coming from buildings and other sources. The one thread that is common throughout almost all of these different sources is that individual consumers have no personal power to affect most of it. All of the sections have room for radical reductions in their emissions, but in order for those to take place, large systemic changes must occur. To give an example for context, a Midwestern American has to drive to work every day in their gas-powered car because they have no access to public transportation or electric vehicle infrastructure. Can this person reasonably be blamed for causing those emissions when they had no other option? This kind of example exists for basically every emissions category. Individuals, of course, share some of the blame for the crisis, especially wealthier people with more flexibility to make sustainable choices. But to place too much blame on everyday people is short-sighted and counterintuitive. If this is the case, then the ones that need to be held responsible are the ones actually doing the polluting. This is largely governments and corporations. In the case of the U.S., it's basically all corporations, because we have almost no nationalized industry. That being said, this does not mean that these companies should be responsible for finding solutions. As long as our economy operates in the Milton Friedman style of profit above all else, it is unreasonable to expect corporations to have a sudden change of heart, especially when tackling emissions will require substantial capital investment. Instead, we want to suggest a path where individuals and communities closest to the effects of climate change will have the power to leverage redistributed assets to make the necessary changes, which will be discussed further in the next section. Now we have Keelan Anderson establishing the rules of justice and equity in our responses. Climate action should be focused on protecting those most at risk of the detriments of climate change, making it imperative that the nations of the world are dealing with these effects in a just manner. It is important to structure our discussions and actions in a way that is equitable and prioritizes avoiding or minimizing the effects of climate change for those who would suffer the most. Specifically, we will be discussing environmental justice communities. The United States Environmental Protection Agency defines environmental justice communities as populations that are overburdened, 
having disproportionate exposure to environmental hazards and increased vulnerability to said hazards. Environmental justice communities primarily consist of low-income, indigenous, and black populations as these groups are disproportionately vulnerable to environmental hazards, have less opportunity for public participation, and face a host of other socioeconomic obstacles. When we expand that to the world, we end up with billions of people at a direct risk of losing their livelihoods or lives themselves to the climate crisis. Sacrifice to some extent is inevitable, such as the more privileged giving up certain luxuries, corporations investing in clean energy, and governments enforcing action that may seem economically lesser to actions that produce high emissions, but our sacrifice is needed to protect basic human rights and every human being's capability of survival. If we are to increase everyone's protections from environmental harm, we need to prioritize getting the underserved and underprivileged to an acceptable standard of living. By doing so, we ensure that everyone can access basic survival. If we do not structure our responses around these groups, we risk leaving them out of the conversation completely. If our actions only serve to support and protect our well-off, more vulnerable populations will continue to suffer and bear the majority of the pressure of climate change. Everyone here today needs to think of their most vulnerable. Think of the people that cannot run away from a hurricane or hide from a wildfire. Think of your future generations that will carry the world we pass down to them and commit yourselves to doing your best to give them a planet of safety and prosperity. Finally, Alyssa Andres is going to present the implementation of these ideals and how to influence compliance and collaboration. In regards to tackling the task of implementing these ideas effectively, we must find ways to persuade the general public based on moral and philosophical ideas surrounding climate change and climate justice. The way in which we must implement these said ideas is to first create a general sense of urgency and necessity around the issue of climate change and justice. Many people are still not persuaded by the increase in temperature to believe that this is a very real thing that needs to be dealt with at this moment in time before it gets worse. It is more important to emphasize that the vulnerability factor is morally relevant in this situation. By showing people that they too risk exposure to this, they will in turn care and want to take action in order to prevent the further worsening of climate change. This could be done through mitigations as a demand of justice throughout the future generations to distribute the costs that climate change impose in order to increase present costs but reduce future ones. In addition, big corporations who contribute to CO2 emissions should bear most of the burden as well as transportation companies. It should also be brought to attention and heavily recognized that climate change also affects people differently and can exasperate inequitable social conditions for different groups. Therefore, those who profit off of prompting climate change, like fossil fuel giants in the United States, should bear some of the financial burden, if not most. This way, the groups affected by the negative impacts of climate change also receive justice in their own way. Despite this, however, change can be made at the most basic level by American citizens who decide the cause is important enough to help. Actions like switching to solar power energy or making an effort to use electric vehicles are all ways that can slowly but surely help decrease CO2 emissions. In conclusion, climate change is a pressing issue that becomes more dangerous every day in order to make real progress to prevent these issues from imposing on us even more. Taking these actions now are what will ultimately sustain our planet for the future before it is much too late. That brings us to a close for our Climate Ambition Summit. Remember, we are all in this together, protecting people and our planet.